Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College, continuing our con com conversation on the connective tissues with a focus now on how these tissues are classified. So we're going to look at the various criteria that scientists use in order to group or classify the connective tissues. Now let's do a quick refresher and remind ourselves of what the criteria were to classify the epithelial tissues. In the case of the epithelial tissues, we looked at two criteria, right? We looked at the, the shape of the cells, and we also looked at the number of cell layers. Two very easy criteria. It's not quite so simple for the connective tissues, so let's take a look. The connective tissues are also classified based on just two criteria, but they're very different than those from those of the epithelial tissues. So in the case of the connective tissues, we actually look at what makes up the matrix of the connective tissues, that is that extracellular material. And we also look at what kinds of cells are present. So what, what is the matrix made up of? What kinds of cells are present? Let's for now focus on that composition of the matrix. And we'll use the picture here on your right, which by the way is an example of a, a loose connective tissue. You'll understand better what that means once we learn about the specific connective tissues. More, even more specific, this is an areolar connective tissue. This is actually the tissue that we very um, most that we always see right next door to our epithelial tissues. Notice that there aren't all that many cells and the cells are only showing their nuclei in this particular picture, but there aren't a whole lot of these cells. What we see is a lot of material outside of the cells. <clears throat> and so all of that material outside of the cells is our matrix. Now within that matrix, we see these lines, these pink bands, ribbons, and we also see the thinner lines. Those are fibers, and what those are, are just strings of proteins. So they're just strings of proteins to make these fibrous structures. Therefore, if we stay out of the cells, because we're focusing on the matrix here, and we're excluding the fibers, then we just see all of this white space here, right? That is referred to as the ground substance, right? All these spaces here. Now, one thing that is missing on this picture, I must say, is the fact that we would also see some blood vessels um, present in this tissue. Here's a cross section of a little blood vessel, maybe another one here, and here's a longitudinal view of a little blood vessel. So this would definitely be a vascularized tissue. There's plenty of space for blood vessels. Okay, um, to come back now for a moment to the ground substance. Remember that's where all these white spaces are. That ground substance is going to be made up of different organic and sometimes also inorganic materials. For instance, in bone tissue, we're going to see calcium phosphate crystals in this ground substance, and that's what makes the bone tissue so hard. Uh, in cartilage, we'll see something else, and then in yet the other tissue groups, we'll see um, uh, you know, different chemicals present to make the, the ground substance anywhere from more fluid, for instance in blood, clearly the plasma, which is the ground substance in the blood, is very fluid. So the composition of the ground substances, that, that chemical makeup, can really impact how hard or how liquid the ground substance is. Now we're not going to go into any great detail about the chemistry or the biochemistry or the uh, chemical composition of the ground substance. We'll just say a few things. We will go in more depth on the fibers and then we'll go and take a look at what kinds of cells we often find in the connective tissues. So again, the ground substance is all that stuff that you find in between the cells and the fibers and it can be a very liquidy 
ground substance to more jello-like as we would see in the cartilages versus very hard as we would see in bone tissue. So first off, what is the function of ground substance? And then we'll talk more about its composition. Well, the ground substance functions as a medium through which nutrients and gases can diffuse to reach cells that need these nutrients and, and gases or for wastes to diffuse and be returned back to the bloodstream. So you can think of it as a sieve, right? So what we find in the ground substance for the most part is water. So mostly water, maybe not so much in bone tissue, but in most of the connective tissue, the ground substance is mostly water. And in that water, we see organic molecules made up of a protein with some sugars attached. So we have a core of a protein, of some kind of a protein, and stuck onto that are these large polysaccharides. And <clears throat> some of the common polysaccharides you might actually have heard about, such as chondroitin sulfate and hyaluronic acid. Um, chondroitin especially is common in the cartilages, which is why some people take chondroitin supplements. These proteoglycans and especially the large polysaccharides, uh, they're very good at uh, trapping and holding on to water. And that then again impacts the, the, the density and the fluidity of our ground substance. Enough said about ground substance. Let's take a closer look now at the fibers. And now there are three kinds, even though on our picture, we really only see two kinds. And notice that they spell fiber on the picture more the British way or perhaps even uh, possibly the French way. So there are three types of fibers. And the way I have listed them here is from strongest to weakest. Strongest and thickest, I guess I could say, to weakest and thinnest, right? So the collagen fibers are these big pink ribbons that you see crisscrossing through the slide. And they are made up of a protein, very hard to remember, called collagen. So their protein, that is the protein that's uh, making up this fiber is called collagen. Now collagen fibers in with the kind of composition, chemical composition of these collagen proteins provide what we call tensile strength. This is a term you're going to see over and over again, particularly when we get to the bones. Your bones are full of collagen fibers. And collagen fibers have the ability to give way a little bit to stretch, but not much. They lock up. So they do not allow for much stretching at all. And of course, that protects us. Think, for instance, we see um, a good example of a location where we find lots of uh, uh, collagen fibers is in ligaments and tendons. Right? So tendons connect a muscle to a bone or bones, and you wouldn't want a tendon to be able to stretch too much because then that muscle could not move that bone very well anymore. Similar principle for ligaments which interconnect bones, bone to bone, you wouldn't want a ligament to stretch too much because then those bones would come apart too far and it would be rather <laughs> difficult to make any kinds of decent <clears throat> movements. In addition, um, these collagen fibers <clears throat> excuse me, therefore prevent um, these, these ligaments and tendons to tear um, or to break apart. So that's, all, that, that's sort of a long explanation for what we mean by tensile strength. The thinner fibers that you see, they're kind of dark purple here, those lines, those are elastic fibers and their protein is called elastin. Now, you know what elasticity means. We think of a rubber band, right? Careful, elasticity do doesn't just mean to be able to stretch. What is the big feature of elasticity? 
It's the fact that our rubber band, for instance, or our elastic fibers can recoil back to their original size and shape. This is a really important feature, this recoiling. Think, for instance, of our aorta, right? Our aorta has many elastic fibers in it. And why is that? Well, the aorta is the big, big artery that receives the blood from the heart. And the aorta's responsibility is to distribute that blood through pretty much the whole body, except the lungs. The lungs have their own major artery. That takes effort. And so when the heart squeezes and pumps its blood into the aorta, <clears throat> because of the elastic fibers in the wall of the aorta, the aorta will stretch. But what else does it do? It recoils and that helps push that blood, blood further down the aorta. It's almost as if the aorta is, is kind of like a heart itself because it can stretch and recoil and push that blood forward. Your lungs are full of elastic fibers too, such that they can distend and recoil. And you'll come up with many other examples down the road. Finally, <clears throat> we get to the very delicate fibers and they are called reticular fibers. Interestingly enough, they are also made up of collagen, but it's a much more delicate form of collagen. And what this collagen does, or what these fibers, I should say, do, is something very typical. They create this network or meshwork, and I'm just drawing a bunch of scribbles because that's kind of what these fibers look like, like so. And they provide, oh, by the way, we call this meshwork or network of these reticular fibers, we call this a stroma, right? And we find these reticular fibers, especially in um, organs and tissues that belong to the lymphatic system, such as your lymph nodes and your spleen and your red bone marrow, just to, to name a few examples. And in these locations, there are there can it depends on where exactly we are in, in the lymphatic system but but for instance in the spleen and the red bone marrow there are lots of um, blood cells let's say red blood cells even in the spleen we would see white blood cells and all of these cells which are typically very round that's how you can always tell you're looking at either red or white blood cells they use this stroma to hang out in all the little nooks and corners like so Okay, we need to use a special stain to make these very delicate reticular fibers to show. So um, I'll show you that here in the next few slides. So here we're looking at a pretty nice slide of a, a big artery with a, a thick wall. So what you're seeing here is the lumen and you can assume that in this lumen that's where we would find blood, right? as in the form of red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets and plasma, right? Which we, not, we still need to discuss too later on, what blood, why blood is connective tissue. Um, this very dark layer here, you know by now that that has to be our simple squamous epithelial tissue. Um, we can refer to the layer as the endothelium. And the reason why you can't see the individual squamous cells is because of the stain that was used. The stain that was used is to really show these elastic fibers. So if we move away from our squam simple squamous epithelial tissue, we start to see connective tissue. And in this connective tissue, we see a layer with many, many, many squigglies. And that's where we have the elastic fibers. So big arteries are similar to what I described earlier for the aorta, they have the, the ability to stretch and recoil. Here we see an image, or a slide on the right at least, a microscope slide of the spleen, which is characterized by reticular fibers. So all of these thin black lines that you see, those are the reticular fibers that, remember, form 
that so-called stroma. And hiding in all the little nooks and corners of these reticular fibers are going to be um, blood cells. This is a very characteristic look for the spleen. We'll, I'll point out collagen fibers as we visit the actual specific connective tissue types, um, so that would be in another video. So this brings us to the different cells found in the connective tissues. Remember that we need to look at the cells found in the connective tissues in addition to studying the composition of the matrix, right? So when we learned about how to classify the connective tissues at the start of this video, there were two criteria to look at, and that's the composition of the matrix. And the matrix is made up of two things, the ground substance, I'll abbreviate that, and fibers. Most of you will, especially if you're in lab and, and to identify slides in my class, um, you will take a very close look at the kinds of fibers that are present. You're not going to always be able to you know, understand the chemical makeup of the ground substance because you don't have that ability to look, uh, to, to do that by just looking at a slide on the screen or under the microscope. But the fibers um, together with the cells that are present usually give us a good idea of what tissue that we're looking at. So, what kinds of cells do we find in the connective tissues? Well, <clears throat> First of all, we can separate our cells into cells that are mature and they're going to end in site versus cells that aren't quite mature yet and they'll end in blast. We'll talk about the last group here in just a second. So those cells that end in blast and that are immature, their responsibility is to actually make parts of the matrix. So they may make fibers or they may make parts of the ground substance. So for instance, fibroblasts, they are immature cells and guess what part of the matrix they secrete? Fibers, indeed. There are also um, adipoblasts, adipo referring to fast, fat, or osteoblasts, what do you think those are? Osteo meaning bone, right? And chondroblasts, those, the prefix chondro always means cartilage, so those are immature cartilage cells. And each one of these cells can mature further, further into, for instance, adipocytes, fibrocytes, osteocytes, chondrocytes. So that's how that works. <clears throat> now, in bone tissue, we actually have a third cell, or I should say cell type, and that's called the osteoclast. This is a different cell. Um, its responsibility is to literally break down bone tissue. And when we get to the bone tissues, we'll talk more than enough about the various bone cells. And you've already learned three osteoblast, <clears throat> osteocyte, and osteoclast. In many of our connective tissues, and notice I say many, I'm not saying all, but in many of the connective tissues, we see a variety of cells. And we can sort of separate them according to them wandering around versus staying put. So I just have titled these lists of cells as residential cells versus mobile cells. So the residential cells, as I say, stay put. And there's a, a variety of them, and we've already discussed what some of these are. The fibroblasts make fibers. Adipocytes are mature fat cells. Uh, interestingly enough, fat cells on their own or in little groups occur in many different tissues, not just in fat tissue. Um, you might not enjoy hearing that, but remember there are good aspects about adipose tissue. We do need to store fat um, to have an energy reserve. 
They're usually big cells. You see them right here. Here we see uh, a, um, a pointer towards a fibroblast, which is a very branchy cell. And we also have a nice nucleus here. Melanocytes are also not just found in our skin. We often find them in the connective tissues. Clearly, they are cells that make the, the protein pigment called melanin. It's what gives your skin its color and it's in your eyes and your hair. We've discussed what mesenchymal cells are. Remember, those are our stem cells that um, arose from the mesoderm and they... Um, Give, can give rise to pretty much any of our connective tissues. And then finally, we have macrophages. Now, we have macrophages that I've put under the residential cells that stay put. But they can release chemicals and alert the free macrophages. So they can release all kinds of chemical messengers and tell the free macrophages, hey, there's all kinds of pathogens here that we need to eat up, go through phagocytosis. That's why they're called macrophages. Um, you need to come help and you need to come over here, right? So that brings us then to our mobile cells. And most of our mobile cells are white blood cells. So there are several white blood cells. We don't just have lymphocytes. And lymphocytes, um, some of them, not all, are the ones responsible for making antibodies. You might have heard of B lymphocytes, especially if you've taken microbiology. So your B lymphocytes, they make the antibodies. So that's one type of white blood cell. Um, so they are white blood cells, yeah. uh, the B lymphocytes. There are others. Um, macrophages are actually white, a certain kind of white blood cell that has left the bloodstream. So if this is a tiny little capillary and a, this um, white blood cell, which I'll draw in the blue here, is here or here or there. So there's three of them. They can actually leave the bloodstream and enter the surrounding tissues and when they do that they become macrophages. Again you'll learn more in AMP2 which specific white blood cells do that. Now <clears throat> there are also so-called mast cells in amongst the mobile cells which are the top cells here and they're important when it comes to inflammation. So let me use a different color so that you can keep track of where I'm drawing all my scribbles. So the mast cells play a role in inflammation by secreting two important chemicals. One is heparin, and I think many of you know that heparin is a blood thinner. So it keeps your blood flowing, um, prevents the clotting or the stopping of the flow of blood, trying to flush out any uh, pathogen buildup during inflammation you know, during inflammation, and histamine. And histamine is a blood vessel dilator. It's a blood vessel dilator, which, <clears throat> well, let me take that back. It's better to say histamine makes blood vessels, capillaries leaky. Sorry, I needed to correct myself there. So they make capillaries leaky. Sorry, I'm kind of scribbling here. And therefore, that's why you might see some swelling at a, slide, at a site where there's inflammation building up. But all of these, um, well, both of these chemicals and the whole process, process of inflammation is actually a beneficial process to prevent infection from developing. So these mast cells play an important role. These are not white blood cells, by the way. Uh, they are a different type of uh, cell that plays a role in our immune system. By the way, now it may, might make more sense why you take antihistamines. It is to prevent the inflammation um, in your body. Okay, so then let's 
remind ourselves that there are the mesenchymal cells that function as stem cells for our connective tissue, so they're capable of differentiating into any connective tissue. Remember what that word means to differentiate. It means the turning on and off of specific genes in a cell. And that makes the cell more specialized. So turning on and off in a cell. There we go. <clears throat> But we have an additional stem cell, and that brings us to our red bone marrow. We have two types of bone marrow in the body, and one is called red bone marrow, one is called yellow bone marrow. We'll learn when we get to the skeletal system where these two types of bone marrow are located. Both of them, as the name says, are obviously located in your bones, but in, they can be in different locations. Well. Your red bone marrow is responsible for making our blood. And remember, our blood is made up of plasma, which is mostly water. And then our, our cells, which I'm going to put in parentheses. So we have our red blood cells, our white blood cells, and our platelets. Now, why did I put this, these cells in parentheses? Because red blood cells, for one, have no nucleus. So they're, by definition, or organelles, by definition, they are not cells anymore. The white blood cells are true cells. Platelets, have, they are just fragments of cells. So they are not true cells either. And because of that, we refer to these blood cells as formed elements. That's what we prefer to call them. So be aware of this, that we refer to all of these blood cells more accurately as the formed elements. They're elements formed in the red bone marrow. And the whole process of making these formed elements is called hematopoiesis. Hemato, referring to blood, right? Heme, blood. And poesis is Greek. It's a Greek suffix for making, creating, um, kind of similar to the, the term genesis. So hematopoiesis literally means the making of blood. So in our red bone marrow, all of us have stem cells that have the ability to make every one of our formed elements. And that is our red blood cells, the five types of white blood cell types, and our platelets. So one cell can make all of these different formed elements. And for that reason, we call this cell in our red bone marrow a stem cell. More specifically, we call it the hematopoietic stem cell. So we have turned hematopoiesis, a noun, into an ob um, adjective here. So the hematopoietic stem cell. You can also use this term instead, and that is hemocytoblast. Now that you have a better understanding of how the connective tissues are classified, what the matrix is made up of, what kinds of cells are present, and what they're called, uh, we're finally ready to take a closer look at the actual specific connective tissues. So let's do that in the next video.